Nifty has opened with a cut of about 89 points. So after three days of gains, the markets have opened the holiday shortened week with a cut of about 0.3%. Um, remember, Wall Street too took a bit of a breather and the benchmark indices had opened with a cut. The big drag is coming in from the FMCG names. The Nifty FMCG index has opened in the red. Britannia is your top loser. That's down close to about 1.3%. Nestle, HUL, weak in trade. HDFC Bank is nursing some losses. SBI Life is weak in trade. We're going to watch for HDFC Life. And yes, that's the top Nifty gainer after you know the breather, the relief that's come through on the surrender value. Um, so it's not going to be as onerous as the market was fearing. And HDFC Life is the top Nifty gainer, 2% up on that. Adani Ports, uh, after they've made that acquisition of nearly 1,300 crore rupees, Adani Ports is seeing some strength today. Uh, the mid-cap index opened in the red, but now is back in the green. All in all, it's a muted start in line with what uh, the pre-open was suggesting. It's about 40, 50 points down <coughs> on the Nifty cut of about a quarter of a percent. All right, Rima, a few stocks that are moving around. Mankind Pharma, the stock is down close to 3%. Massive volumes out there. I think that large trade has taken place. Keep an eye on that stock. It's down 3% because of that reason. Now, show Clayland, yesterday they've announced a 4 rupee 95 paise dividend. And the record date they have fixed is 3rd of April. So, explains why that stock as well is up close to 100%. Now, you'll be wondering that HDFC Life is the biggest gainer on the Nifty, while uh, SBI Life is the biggest loser. The reason is that SBI life gets least impacted because of these regulations. And also, that could be now a bit of a switch. So, you have SBI life actually that's underperforming, while HDFC life is outperforming. Yash tells me that in case those regulations did come about, revised regulations did come about, HDFC life would be the one that gets the hardest hit. Now, that's not come about. So, actually, HDFC life is seeing some bit of a relief in today's trading session. A couple of other big uh, stocks that are moving around, Max Financial. It has valuation support as well. This uh, no change in terms of regulations has come as a positive. So that's the big winner. And you know, if you pull up a valuation parameter, you'll see it's trading at a sharp discount in comparison to its peers. So that's up close to 5.5%. ICICI Prudential as well up close to 3.5%. And Indus Stars, just take a look at the way that stock has moved. In the last seven trading sessions, it's moved from around 230 to around 278. There is uh, that wait for a large trade to take place. But in the meanwhile, the stock is flying away. And as we highlighted earlier today as well, JSPL, well, fundamentally things looking up for the steel sector because there is a correction in the raw material cost. The problem is steel prices are not moving up, but the promoter entity, that's Mr. Naveen Jindal, has joined the ruling party BJP and he'll contest Lok Sabha elections. The stock normally gets a bit of a discount in comparison to its peers because of political uncertainty. Maybe that's a little behind them now and that's why the stock is looking up to an upper percent higher in today's session. Survey. Uh, it's all about the broader market recovery. I mean, I think uh, that's what started towards the end of last week and that seems to be playing out even now. So, if we talk about uh, some more names, uh, the, the movers and shakers, so to speak, watch out for Interglobe Aviation. After the analysts meet, uh, some of the brokerages, Jefferies, for instance, they've upgraded their targets. Now, they have, a, I, I think, a hold rating earlier. They had a you know, negative rating on the stock. And they've upgraded their EBITDA estimates uh, by almost 12-13% as well. So, Interglobe is holding out quite okay. Uh, the insurers, as uh, Nigel also mentioned, Max is retaining that 6% gain. ICICI Prudential Life, 3-3.5% three, three higher. So that's the other one to look out for. Vedanta, Nigel was telling us, I mean, that it's after uh, six long years, we'll see some resumption go on mining. But he also, you know, told us a very important context. That qualitatively, it doesn't move the needle much, the kind of, uh, you know, iron ore you get in Goa. But anyway, for what it's worth, there's a little bit of green on that stock as well. Let's move beyond and see what else is moving in the broader markets because that's where the... The churn seems to be Avenue Supermart. Some of the brokerage upgrades that Manglam was talking about, they're working well on the stock. 2% higher. Indus Towers is up 1.5%. Remember, Indus was a long call that Mitesh gave us on the technicals, saying that he sees a bit of a breakout. So that, uh, that call's working well. Some of the other insurance players as well. New India Assurance is up and about. KPIT Tech is having a good early morning. 2% higher. Uh, look at EIH, NBCC. There's Dr. Lal, Path Labs, Jyoti CNC, the, the recent listing. 6.5%, 7% higher. So basically... The broader market seems to be alive and kicking. And the large cap screen, not bad actually. We've managed to recover quite well from the first initial cut. The Nifty is just about 30 odd points negative now. And watch out for some of the tech names. Look at HCL Tech. Smart intraday recovery from the opening lows. Even Wipro for that matter. Remember, that's the question that we were putting up as we started. Whether the whole reaction to Accenture, whether that was done and dusted in one day. Uh, because the important caveat there is that Accenture did a guidance cut, but the year ends in August. Mm. And a lot of these companies are talking about recovery in the second half, which means, you know, August and beyond. So, 
maybe it's not really apple to oranges just looking at the time uh, time horizon mm. so it seems to be looking at some recovery as well i just one word on mankind pharma you know i'm looking at a novama alternate and quant desk research report that's come about they're saying post is 3% that's changed hands you know the revised shareholding for the march quarter that's reported by april 16th which in all probability should happen then the stock automatically would qualify for the msei may 2024 review so that's the reason why the stock has recovered a little bit from the low point of the day post that deal the free float will increase and that's what helps it get into the msei review as well so that's a stock that i'm looking at another one that we're looking at is uh, you know imfa that's indian metals they announced very very late in the friday trading session that they'll be considering a special dividend in the next couple of years things that are working for them well they have got some part of that compensation from jspl so that's why they're going to be considering that special dividend and ferrochrome prices have moved up and as i told you earlier for the some of these users of coking coal it's good news because coking coal costs are down by close to 10% in the last 7 to around 8 sessions so explains why some of these stocks are doing very very well Well, I for finance and GM Financial are also weak in trade. It's straight away open with a cut of about two to three percent. Remember, they will they're likely to face more RBI scrutiny. The central bank has floated an e-tender to seek interest from firms to conduct a special audit. on gm financial and ifl finance for the regulatory lapses uh, whether it was related to gold loan disbursement or the ipo financing um so i think on 12th of april is what the rbi has said that the special audit will be conducted on these two firms and there is that regulatory overhang as they face more scrutiny and these are two stocks which are under pressure today yeah you know one more to add to the list and it's an interesting one pb fintech now stocks flat it's not doing anything this morning mm. but remember that bima sugam has been launched along with this whole surrender value in new norms what is bima sugam basically it's a giant you know aggregator portal where you can buy insurance and you know get serviced as well so from the face of it it looks like a bit of a competitor uh to the kind of business model that pb fintech has going and it's all about margins and this being a you know wide upi kind of platform maybe there's going to be a bit of a margin crunch we'll see how it plays out but pb fintech has done exceedingly well in the last one year and for the time being it's not showing any sort of a major negative reaction to the launch of this uh, big uh, sort of uh, portal from iradai but let's move on and welcome our market master now on the show harish krishnan Uh, is joining in he's of course a senior fund manager at equities at kotak amc harish great to have you on the show let me ask you the most difficult question is the mid cap small cap correction over you know and i mean just to expand on that really i think uh, markets and investors newer investors get really jittery even with a 5 10% kind of a decline but it was a bit of a scare uh, what do you think uh, you know are we are, are we past the worst basically uh so right uh, there has been a small correction for sure uh, but we've still come back to levels which were there in say december of 2023 so such has been the extent of the parabolic move that we've seen that uh, you know this uh, correction while welcome in terms of clearing away some of the froth uh, has just brought us back to the levels which were there in december of 23 um i think from a overall sense while we positive on the economic construct Uh, the fact that we have got counter cyclical both the, on the monetary side as well as on the fiscal side so therefore you you do uh, you know you are seeing growth which is without steroids which is very welcome uh, on the other hand the only negative uh, if if one main could be that the sentiment uh, is extremely exuberant even as uh, uh, even post this correction so i think it's only about uh, how do we marry the entry price Uh, to to put in uh, reasonably large sums of capital uh, so that the uh, underlying experience for our investors over the course of the next 3 5 years uh, becomes a lot lot better so while uh, uh, it is welcome uh, i think some of the froth has gone off uh, of course when the index corrects by about 10 12% a lot more stocks fall anywhere between say 20 30% and that for it provides some opportunities uh, for us to add on to some exposures across various sectors mm uh you are in a way betting on metals also harish i was listening to some of your previous interactions and metals is a sector which you've classified as a dark horse now this is a bit of a contra trade not too many you know the consensus opinion is not very bullish on metals so can you take us through your view there so metals is uh, clearly as you uh, rightly uh, coined it it's a dark cost trade it's a contrarian trade uh, a lot of uh, you know is predicated on what china does given the fact that it's the largest consumer and supplier of metals 
Um, so the the sense that we have is twofold. Uh, one is that uh, you know uh, obviously given the extent of push that China is seeing, uh, you know with respect to its economic construct, we do think that it's quite conceivable that we can see some kind of uh, uh, follow through from the government uh, in terms of some policy easing. Now whether it's going to be a big bank fixed asset uh, investment creation, which was the case in the last decade, possibly not. But uh, at least there's going to be some kind of a pushback. That is uh, that is one uh, conjecture. The second is that uh, a lot of Indian companies have come uh, in this cycle with very little debt. Uh, so unlike the previous cycles where uh, you know the Indian companies also got hit uh, by significant amount of debt that they were carrying, this time around there is uh, limited uh, debt on their balance sheets. The balance sheet health of most Indian uh, metal companies are uh, in fine fettle, and therefore uh, you know it, it kind of limits the downside from a meaningful point of view. The third aspect is, you know, from an ownership point of view, uh, we do think that there is very little ownership in the space, and therefore that provides uh, a reasonable sense of, uh, you know, uh, a, a better uh, risk reward and a slightly higher margin of safety. And which is why we think from a medium term perspective, uh, we, we are wanting to take some exposure into the metal space. All right. Uh... Hi, Harish. Good morning and good to see you. An interesting call out there. Under ownership and balance sheets in much better shape than what we have seen in the previous cycle. And that's one of the reasons why you're positive. Quick question since we're talking about metals. Ferris or non-ferris, what do you prefer? Uh, so ideally, it would be non-ferrous given the uh, the significant extent of usage, uh, you know, across industries. We are going through this massive electrification drive across the world, and therefore, uh, you know, it, it genuinely uh, does uh, prefer the non-ferrous. But uh, I guess uh, you know, by and large, metals move as a homogeneous pack. It isn't that uh, you know uh, they, there's too much of distinction from a price action point of view. But from a slightly longer term construct, uh, we do prefer the non-ferrous over the ferrous. Got it. And you know, for the non ferrous space, you also have the dollar play out there. A weaker dollar will be good news for LME prices, which could help them. So we got that. What about, you know, I wanted to ask you, Harish, besides sectors and themes, there is some kind of cautiousness with regard to earnings growth because we did see margin expansion, but top line growth wasn't that good. So part of the street is saying, hey, maybe bulk of this margin expansion is now behind us and the top line growth doesn't look like it's going to come as much as anticipated. Do you think there's a risk to FY25 earnings or do you think we'll be fine? I think it's a reasonably fair construct. Now, uh, we do think that, uh, you know, the top line growth has been sluggish across sectors. So, uh, you know, while we can talk about headline numbers, I think what's more important for us is the breadth of the earnings across, say, the top 200 companies. And we've definitely seen a sluggish top line growth across multiple sectors, uh, notably on the consumption side. I think investment as a theme is still doing quite well uh, when we look at both from a top line construct. Obviously, over there, the bigger construct is that of the order inflow. And that that definitely is swimming to do much better. But uh, purely from a, uh, you know, a top line point of view, I think uh, there's a greater pressure in terms of consumption. So, uh, and that that obviously uh, feeds into multiple sectors and subsectors. Uh, so we are a bit sanguine on the fact that you know that that is one area which is kind of slowing down. Um, of course, um, uh, you know uh, whether it can see some kind of pullback. I think it's also a function that uh, you know, especially in consumption, uh, there's been a significant amount of margin increase that has happened across the board, uh, especially on the FMCG pack. And therefore, we do think that, uh, you know, there is going to be some kind of price uh, correction that needs to happen to excite back the customer. And uh, therefore, we do think that, you know, without, uh, uh, you know, margin, uh, without top line uh, coming through, uh, even margins are at risk uh, for a lot of these companies. So uh, the broader call out is uh, clearly investment over consumption at uh, um, uh, from our perspective. And uh, within that, obviously, uh, sectors which are more geared towards uh, government and private capex as well as on the real estate side is what we think, uh, you know, are in better shape at this point of time. Arish, uh, two PSU sectors where we've seen a parabolic up move have been one, defence, and the other one is uh, railways, where we have seen greater spend by the government on defence and railways. Uh, the order wins have been exceedingly strong. But the question now is on valuations. And are they comfortable or uncomfortable, even if you have a longer term time horizon? Where do you stand on defence and railways? 
So I think uh, we have a lot more circumspect on both of these. Uh, so if you look at, say, defense, uh, you know, uh, and I'm just talking about index level, say, NSE index uh, on defense is trading on a price to book of close to about 10 times. Uh, it is even higher than the price to book of, say, the NSE consumption index. Uh, now, these are very rarefied uh, entry-level multiples. So while there's a lot positive going on, including the export opportunity that Indian defense companies can cater to, as well as the indigenization drive that the government is focusing on, and uh, obviously defense is a very topical uh, point today, given the geopolitical scenario that's there. We are, we think that you know the, the uh, current uh, valuations pretty much cap out uh, any prospect of, uh, of, uh, of you know, further... Uh, uh, medium term value creation. So we are a bit circumspect on both of these uh, within the broader uh, PSU pack. Okay. So Sanjay, you know, overall, <clears throat> given the the construct and uh, sort of what we are in for, I think the next event now is obviously we get into earnings and then finally uh, the, you know, the election event. Uh, for, for Q4, what are you expecting? Because Q3, we came off fairly okay. I mean, there weren't too many disappointments. So in the near term, next uh, three to four months, as we get through this event season, uh, you know, how are you expecting the market to behave? So near term is anyone's guess, and I guess <laughs> we are no wiser uh, than uh, than at least many others on the street. Uh, so uh, what is it that we are looking forward to from uh, from assessing whether our medium term thesis is right? Is uh, primarily as uh, as rightly called out in the previous question as well. Uh, is uh, in terms of whether uh, there is uh, you know volume growth coming back, especially on consumption side. That's a that's a key yard, uh, yardstick that we are looking at across sectors as to where is the volume growth uh, because it's been a bit elusive um, obviously there's been a significant inflationary push uh, you know from a pre-covid to a post-covid level and uh, you know, uh, to a certain extent that may have impacted volume so uh, volume growth is definitely a key area uh, if i look at other sectors i think auto is something where uh, we've seen a reasonable amount of persistence of demand um, and uh, especially as far as the passenger car vehicle and to a certain extent two wheeler uh, what we are slightly more sanguine is on the agri side and on the CV side. Uh, so that's as far as the auto side is concerned. Um, as far as uh, investment, uh, like I said, uh, obviously government is a very big enabler and a catalyst and is also a big spender on uh, on the investment side. And therefore, it's very important to see, uh, you know, the contours of uh, the political formation that does come through over the course of the next three, four months. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously, uh, um, you know, a similar government formation with a focus on investment uh, is therefore welcome from a from a medium term construct because it does bring in that productivity benefits uh, that can help uh, catalyze the overall economic activity for a longer runway. So investment is something that we continue to keep a watchful eye on. Uh, uh, over there, we are more uh, focused incrementally on private capex as to how that is shaping up uh, just in terms of numbers. Uh, you know, pre-COVID, this number used to be about 6 lakh crores for the listed uh, companies. Uh, it has moved now to close to about 8 lakh crores. Uh, we think that there is still room for a meaningful increase in terms of the private capex. And therefore, we need a conducive enabling framework to persist, uh, which will see us there. So that's uh, something that we look out for. The third area is clearly that of the export basket. Now, uh, this is something which is more driven by what's happening in the geopolitical landscape as well as, uh, you know, in the advanced economies uh, from a perspective of whether uh, they are going to see some kind of a slowdown. Um, from a, from a U.S. market, uh, we do see actually a stronger resilience and a pushback uh, to the slowdown narrative. And uh, to a certain extent, while that can kind of delay the rate cut uh, theory, uh, but I think uh, a stronger nominal growth does uh, actually benefit the export uh, push through uh, even in the near term. So uh, export is an area of opportunity for us. Uh, we are positive on pharma and healthcare. Uh, we are looking out in terms of, uh, you know, price stability in the generics basket, as well as in terms of API correction. So I think that's the area of opportunity for us. Uh, what we are uh, watching out for is on the chemical side, where there's been a significant amount of pain in the last two, three years. Uh, and we are watchful of uh, how the geopolitical landscape comes through, uh, so as to take a slightly more constructive view over there. So it's uh, it's across a whole range of sectors, but that's, that's what we are looking out uh, when we assess the next three, four months. Got it, Harish. Uh, appreciate you joining in and giving us your view on all those uh, sectors that we discussed. Uh, 
Wishing you a good day ahead and we look forward to having a chat with you rather soon. Well, let's focus though on the life insurance space and Yash has been on top of that one. He's joining in to give us a quick revision of what the street was fearing with regard to regulations coming on the life insurers and it's not come about. That's why we have few of these talks that are celebrating. Yash, put into context. Well, Nigel, the regulations that we're talking about are with respect to surrender value. What is surrender value? It's a, a price that is given uh, to the policy holder in case of voluntary and early surrender of policies. Now, in December 2023, the regulator had come out with a proposal uh, you know, which spoke about increasing the surrender value and the increase was significant, about two times of what exists today. Of course, that put a significant pressure on all the life insurance companies. They were back and forth and now finally, in terms of final regulations, what we have from the regulator is a watered version, a completely watered version of what had been proposed in December 2023. What the regulator has done is practically brought back the surrender value to the point as it exists today. So no increase in that sense uh, across, uh, you know, the parameters in terms of time parameters for surrender value. Uh, now what this does is it removes the majority of the overhang from life insurance companies in terms of uh, a potential increase uh, in what they would have had to pay uh, to their policyholders in case of surrenders and reduces the uh, the margin pressure also which could have come about with this particular increase. Now what the regulator said is that they will have graded surrender value which means as the policy matures the, uh, the value of uh, surrender would increase but uh, large surrenders happen between the first and the seventh year and in this particular period the surrender value which has been assigned by the regulator is largely same as it exists today. Uh, now 30% is the surrender value in the second year as proposed by the regulator, 35% in the third year, 50% between the fourth and the seventh year, 90% in the last two years. Now, just to give you uh, uh, the comparison between the numbers in terms of what was proposed in December 2023 and what has come about now, in the second year, what was proposed was a surrender value of 83,750 on a 1 lakh premium annually. What has come about is just 30,000. In the third year, that surrender value proposed was 1.67 lakh. What has come about is just 70,000. In the fourth year, 2.51 lakh. What has come about is just about a lakh and a half. Fifth year, 3.35 lakh was proposed. What has come about is 2 lakh. So what means is, what this means is that in the first seven years, the surrender value remains the same as it exists today. And large part of policies get surrendered between the first and the seventh year, which means no significant impact on life insurance companies with respect to negative margins on anything on those negative lines. Oh, absolutely, uh, Yash, thank you very much. But I, I guess as someone who also tracks personal finance, uh, for me the question really is that who's happier today, insurance companies or those who are insured? Maybe the regulators really try to strike a balance, which is what it's all about. Thank you very much for uh, you know giving us the detailed contours of the final surrender value norms that have come through. To talk about this and get some more perspective, we have Tarun Chog, MD and CEO of Bajaj Alliance Life Insurance joining in. We also have Gurmeet Chadha, Managing Partner and CIO at Complete Circle uh, with us. Thank you, gentlemen, so much for being with us. Uh, you know, uh, Mr. Chuk, let me open with you, and that's really the thought, right? First, uh, the market also took this very negatively, thinking that surrender values will be increased by, by a, uh, you know, a big notch. But clearly, that's not what the regulator has gone with. It's probably, you know, listened to the concerns coming in from the industry. Uh, tell us the business impact, because the calculations show that for the first three years, the, the three years is absolutely no change at all. And a small increase in the value that you have to pay to the uh, to the you know policy holders uh, after three years, four to seven years. Uh, so, to what extent uh, does it impact uh, companies in general, and maybe you in particular? Yeah. So, uh, I think it's a good balanced approach, as you mentioned. Uh, the good thing is that uh, both the customers and the uh, companies have been taken care of in this. So the impact on company valuation should not be much. There will be a slight come down because a certain category of products will be slightly impacted. Uh, but having said that, uh, see what we have to understand is if you go to the background of all of this, life insurance is largely a long-term uh, product. So the moment you try to do too much of surrender initially, when we did our math, first time I think this math was done for the sector, when we went to the uh, IRDA, they also realized, and we were able to put it forward, that uh, the biggest loser actually would have been the customer because the IRRs would come out. Usually, typically, in these products, we invest up to 20-25% in equity plans, and that gives us the upside for customers. Uh, and now, given the fact, the uncertainty on surrenders, which could 
you know, the surrenders could happen next year itself or almost the same year. So as a result, we would have to invest in cash, overnight cash, where the IRR, hence you can make out, would be significantly different. So I think the balance approach came out well. The IRD has nudged the sector to come up with a separate stream of products which have higher surrender values and uh, a little bit has been adjusted to increase surrender values in the existing products. So overall for the sector, it's fine. And I think the growth uh, of the sector would have been impacted significantly as well. That would be also maintained. You know, do, do you have a, a you know a rough number perhaps uh, for the the sector as a whole? You know, which is the year in which maximum number of policies actually you know uh, get sort of truncated prematurely? Uh, do people usually do that in year two, year three, or is it seen higher in in the later years? Because now the regulation is very clear that if you stay with your policy, uh, the longer you stay, uh, the higher the surrender value in case you need to terminate it prematurely. So what's the current? Uh, break up a rough percentage if you have that in terms of uh, the year in which we're seeing maximum surrendering? So usually it is a sixth year. It's a sixth year when dropouts happen. And I think what has to be understood, these things never get discussed and good you are asking us these questions. If I look at my own company, the average uh, premium paying term of policies is around seven to eight years. So after sixth year, anyways, the uh, surrender values, as you heard from Yash also, get a lot better uh, the moment you're in the last couple of years. So that uh, actually has very little impact on uh, on insurance uh, customers. All right. Which is uh, good. Got it. Hi, Mr. Chug. Good morning and good to see you in. And Gurmeet, thanks a lot for joining in as well. Mr. Chug, I wanted to ask you, you know, brokerages earlier, they were estimating anything between 400 to 500 basis point hit on the VNB margins for life insurers. That's if the earlier proposed surrender value had come into existence. Now, with these new regulations, that hit is entirely out, or could some hits still come about? Yeah, uh, the calculations were near apt. I think uh, would have been even more, in fact, if you ask me. But uh, with this change now, uh, there is very little uh, impact and far, far lesser, if I might say. We are still doing the math. We are waiting the final master circular. Uh, see, some product streams would be impacted. For example, in non-power plans now, there will have to be an asset share as well, which was earlier that concept of a new uh, of an asset share has come. It's a new concept uh, that will impact a certain stream of uh, non-power plans, but largely uh, very little impact now. You can always change the mix, right, over a period of time. Okay, got it. All right, uh, Mr. Chug, we got that. Let's get in Gurmeet as well into the conversation. Hi, Gurmeet. Good morning, and uh, good to see you in. Well, Gurmeet, tell us. Uh, what do y'all like from the insurance pack? Uh, you know, which are the uh, top stocks that you like? And if you could give us some rational as well out there. Sure. Uh, so I think I think this uh, the word threshold premium getting removed from the final draft uh, is a bit of a relief to uh, insurers with high non-par uh, share, as as Mr. Chug also mentioned, because the threshold premium essentially said that above a certain threshold of premium. Uh, you know, the surrender charges can only be applied to a third certain threshold and above that the premium has to be returned, which as you rightly said, could have impacted VNB by maybe 200 to 500 basis points. So that's why you see the, the guys with higher non-par, which is Max and HDFC Life, obviously showing more respite, at least in today's trade. Uh, I think Max has been doing very well if you see nine months of uh, in terms of gross return premium, in terms of AP, I think they've done amongst the best. Uh, also, one of their new product was Step, which is meant for the affluent segment, uh, where you know you uh, pay for just in the terminal illness also, and uh, there's an option of getting the premiums back. That's done very well for them, and they're both banker and proprietary models are doing well. Uh, uh, you know, proprietary model actually grew 45, 46 percent last quarter, and with Axis Bank infusing uh, you know almost 1600 crores, I think eventually it will be Axis Life as as things stand right now. Uh, improve the solvency ratio as well. So I think I think that's something we like. Uh, HGFC Life uh, for the I think mean, HSB has a little bit of a muted year post the uh, tax uh, you know changes which happened in the budget. Also, Nigel Bank's focus has also slightly changed. Anyone with anyone with higher bankish banker share is also getting impacted because banks are very very geared up on deposit mobilization with the with the scenario you have. So I think we like Max. We also like SBI Life, which is more steady. And maybe maybe SGFC life uh, in that pecking order. Mm. 
Uh, Mr. Chuk, IRDAI has also said that no premium can be changed during the entire policy term of the contract. Earlier, it could be changed after three years. Will that be a bit of a negative or a hit to the industry? Uh, see, let, let me just uh, tell you more about this. In saving plans, usually this is a non-issue. It really is an impact in the critical illness plans and in the health plans. Health plans, anyways, uh, we do not write indemnity plans. We write only uh, benefit plans. So then it will uh, finally, so that's not a big big part of the entire piece. So where it then starts hitting us is really the CI plan, the critical illness plans. Uh, see, the problem there is uh, the reinsurance for these will become a little bit more difficult. We'll have to find it. The market will have to adjust to a different level. Uh, so usually uh, earlier, for every three years, we could have looked at the critical illness uh, payouts and uh, the premiums could be revised accordingly. That is not possible anymore. Uh, so it will impact that. We'll have to see how we can take benefit of that for the customer. Good thing is we can now do short-term health plans as well and short-term critical illness plans as well. So that I think will make up for this and uh, uh, we'll have to see whether long-term critical illness plans can be even manufactured now. Hmm. Uh, Mr. Chuk, you know, just to go back to that earlier point and also to, uh, you know, get a sense of the product modifications that you're speaking of, you said that uh, the maximum drop-off happens in the sixth year. I guess that's also because of the way products have been designed, right? Because you're locked in for five years, you have to keep paying premium. And at earlier, it was also sort of, uh, you know, these were policies where the, the policy was being taken more from, a you know, perhaps an investment perspective than pure insurance. And again, on that anyway, there's, there's, there's now a tax clamp down of uh, five lakhs. So uh, going forward, what are the uh, the product modifications that perhaps insurers will make? And will customers also have to be sort of educated that if, you, if you're a customer who perhaps wants to have flexibility of uh, tendering in your insurance policy, uh, you know, before its term ends, uh, then be, be ready to have, uh, you know, a lower return product. Is that how things, is that how things will evolve? See, I think, uh... It, it is uh, very difficult to predict. It's, it's never, never easy to talk about uh, what's going to happen, let's say, a couple of years hence or next year, very clearly with the change of product guidelines. Uh, but what I can say is that uh, a five-year term usually is a, is a pretty long-term term from an Indian mindset. Uh, uh, if you were talking of Japan and other countries, they would usually sell 10-year, 12-year, 15-year products, and they'll be having very high persistency all throughout. Uh, in India, five. Given the way we work, given the way we think, we we keep a lot of options open in our in in front of our financial services uh, plans that we've got. Uh, five years is 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 long enough, and it's really the sixth year dropout. Hence, will impact lesser. And as also had clarified that usually the seventh, eighth year is is where most policies tend to get drawn out. What will happen is customers uh, with this regulator regulation particularly is that customers will have to uh, be given more disclosures, which we're very happy with anyways. Uh, it will break down a lot of the mis-selling when it comes to long-term product selling. Uh, these disclosures, as you see in the regulations coming in, uh, will result in people being more mindful of what they're getting. Uh, that itself will kind of bifurcate the market into two parts. One, somebody who's in investing for the longer term, and one who's looking at uh, maybe any time surrender kind of product. So those kind of surrender products will also start coming. Uh, initially, you're right, those new category of products will not have a very high IRR that uh, you know, we can currently give when uh, we have longer term products uh, because the, like I mentioned, the LM has to be matched. You would not be investing in equities in that. You'd have more cash, overnight cash in it. Uh, that itself uh, will have to be seen. I have a feeling over a couple of years, that will stabilize and the IRs on those products also will come in. Currently, people will test waters with that. Okay. All right. We're in for interesting times for sure. Uh, that is from the policy buyer's perspective. But Gurmeet, uh, last word with you from the investor's perspective. Which life insurance stock would you want to buy now? Now that at least this one overhang is out of the way. Uh, so as I said, uh, Surbhi, we have uh, Max, uh, SBI and SDFC. In fact, Bajaj Finsur, which is not really a pure insurance play. It's uh, Supply on other sectors also gives a lot of valuation comfort. You know, if you see the 
uh, uh, the growth in EPS for last two years and price performance, I think it, it's, 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 it's been quite subdued. Uh, also, I think there's something which I was, I'm talking other than this news is this Bhima Isugam, which is a marketplace for insurers. I think that will eventually lead to more transparency, more interest being catered for everybody in the value chain of insurance, including investors, intermediaries, and, and providers and its impact on policy bazaar. I think that's something which, which the marketplace is something which is, I want to see more in, other than the draft guidelines uh, because a, a PB FinTech has turned for profitable. You know, if you see even nine months now, they are profitable and it's a very asset light model and their credit business also now is picking up pace. So if you see their trail, which is what you make on mortgage on an ongoing basis now contributes 15% to the overall credit revenue. So the trail is also picking up, which makes the, you know, the annuity, annuity flows more stable. Uh, so that's something I'm tracking more other than other than this. You know, Gurmeet, great you brought that up. Actually, PV Fintech is uh, doing very well right now, almost 4% higher. And I want to get uh, Mr. Chuk's comment on, on Bhima Sugam as well. But just to complete the point, Gur uh, Gurmeet, uh, so doesn't a new platform like this, where all insurers have to come through and it's been, you know, put together by the regulator itself, doesn't it offer some sort of, uh, you know, higher competition to a platform like PV Fintech? Right now, the stock is showing no concern at all on margins, on commissions. But just your views on this. So, uh, you know, I think you have to see, it's like ONDC versus Zomato and Swiggy, right? The platforms are always there, just that the market is huge and insurance is a technical product. Half of the terminology people don't understand. And PB Fintech has been working on even non-assisted sales. So one is the assisted sales you do, which is more digital. And then is a non-assisted sales. So insurance, in my views, is still a complex product. So I think it will take time. And that's why I said I want to, look at this space more closely and see what the impact would be. So anybody who's asset light, uh, you know, who's been there for a time would obviously have a first mover advantage. And any marketplace eventually leads to more efficiency in the market. That's my, that's my personal view. Yeah, no fair point. And that's a very valid point that uh, maybe it's still not that easy for people to go and buy policies on their own or DIY as they can do with mutual funds. Maybe that's that's a far more simpler product than insurance. Mr. Chog, your, uh, your view on Bhima Sugam and how that changes things with the industry and just purely in terms of uh, you know, uh, the channels through which you will be now selling, uh, what changes with Bhima Sugam also coming in in terms of insurance and just the whole distribution framework now? I think Bhima Sugam is a significant step forward. Um, an idea, I think, is really being very pragmatic at looking at the way customers would want to buy things in the future. Uh, a significant segment of the customers will find servicing, claim handling, uh, the process uh, of Bhima Sugam uh, to be very smooth and uh, far smoother than what they currently see. More so, it will bring in a lot of transparency uh, in the sector. And transparency is equal to trust. Uh, so the more the trust in the sector, it will only just uh, have a multiplier effect on the market growing. And, and that's what is really uh, my focus. That's what I think will make a big difference because today people when they lock in their money for seven, 10 years aren't really sure. So the moment they see it available on a large platform, which is everybody together, they can see it for themselves. Uh, it will increase the uh, throughput of insurance. I think that's really where I focus on. In terms of uh, distribution, it's, it's all distributors will be present on this as well. So the process for them also becomes easier. Uh, so I think there are no losers, they're only winners in this. Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for joining in. It's been an enlightening discussion. Thank you for your thoughts. We'll get into a break. On the other side, we'll get you an exclusive market conversation with Ramdev Agrawal, joint MD of Motilal Oswal Financial Services.
Welcome back. Well, the markets are still trading with a cut of close to 50 to 60 points, but volumes still on the lower side. Well, let's get you some exclusive market conversations now. My colleague Surbi caught up with Ramdi Agarwal, joint MD of Motilal Oswal Financial Services, to talk about the market trajectory, how one should look at market corrections, and much more. Let's listen to excerpts of that conversation. See, there will be, there is a thing called unknown below in yoga, isn't it? You keep breathing and then you have to breathe, breathe out, out also. also yeah. It is necessary. Yeah. If you don't breathe out, can you can you keep breathing up? <laughs> no. You cannot. Markets are like that. Yeah. Yeah. Every stock, every sector has to breathe up. And then after a big rally, yeah. you have to have a good correction. Sure. Sometimes corrections are immediately after small rally. Sure. Sometimes it's after big rally. Mm -hmm. You know, so, but correction is extremely necessary, essential part of the stock market movement. True. You have to take it for granted. And if you, and that is why it, it is called risk asset. It can be up, it can be down. Sure. And that is what is not being liked by the investors at large. You have to understand it is integral. These are quotational losses. The corrections are quotational losses. They're not losses. Mm. They are quotational losses. You have been overpaid. 100 went to 200. You have been overpaid. Don't take it you are paid. You are still in the stock. Mm. You should have got only 160. So 200 <laughs> has to come to 160. But it will not come to 160. It will come to 140. Mm. Because market has market doesn't have very precise way of uh, giving a price. Mm -hmm. It is very approximate machine. Mm -hmm. You know, it will go five steps up, four steps back, then again seven steps up, then four steps down, like that. So, you know, uh, recently, in the recent past, words like froth, etc. Mm -hmm. were being used yeah, for yeah, yeah, the sure. broader market, mid and small yeah, cap. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you believe that there's Yeah, of course it was there. And do you believe more correction yeah, has to see, happen? Yeah, see, what is happening is, you must understand the factors driving the market right mm -hmm. now. Factors are the number of investors which are coming in. After 75 years, first time we are seeing celebration of retail investing yes. or celebration of stock market. Okay, thanks to digital infrastructure, thanks to KYC norms uh, being uh, eased out, and uh, uh, generally the mandate by government that capital formation uh, in the country is extremely important for the sustained growth in the future. Mm. Okay, now that equity, see, for a country to grow or enterprises to grow, job market to grow, you need enterprises to grow. Enterprises will grow only if you provide them adequate quantity of equity capital to start with at reasonable prices and then debt capital is there if once you have the equity then you have the debt sure. but without equity there is no debt sure. so the, the show doesn't happen mm. so clearly this is happening we are getting about four to five million customers every month mm. and this is a record mm. from 35 40 million in 2020 we have reached last month 150 million i think we are headed straight to 300 million, 300 it's, million and then, well, it's a revolution <laughs> yeah. and it is not going to happen overnight it is going to take three to four years. Sure. And then after that, after 300 million, let's, let's first reach 300 million. Mm -hmm. Then we'll talk about 600 million. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now what is happening is the pace is accelerating. Mm -hmm. Instead of going down after four, five, th four, and then three and a half and three, mm -hmm. it is actually going from three to four to five. And now let's see, we have done 4.65 max. Mm -hmm. I don't know what is the number for March. Mm -hmm. But my sense is now, initially there were only 30, 40 million customers satisfied. So they were bringing their brothers and sisters and all. Yeah. Yeah. Now 150 million are satisfied. Mm. So the whole society after society mm. is coming in. Like the whole city is coming. Whole township is coming. Sure. Whole building is coming. Sure. Sure. So now there is a lot more movement mm. and acceptability mm. of the concept of investing some portion of your savings. See, last year, yeah. between in 23, 24, as of this Friday, the number came. We have collected about 17 lakh crores of fixed deposits. Hmm. Bank deposits have grown by, I think, uh, 13% hmm. uh, and 103. So I think hmm. 17, 18 lakh crores have come. Hmm. I think stock market must have got during the same period about 3 to 4 lakh crores, uh, maybe 5 lakh crores. Hmm. So only, I mean, only one fourth yeah. or one third of the fixed deposit. Yeah. That is not the right thing. Eventually, it will become almost equal. Sure. But that may take five, seven years. So Fair. it is a we are into midst of very huge market. Uh, sorry, uh, what I would say, uh, savings hmm. allocation change in the economy, hmm. and this will happen. It will take time, and hmm. economy has to also perform. Yeah. See, just by bringing money the show is not going to happen. Exactly. People it, are coming because at the end of the yeah. day, they have seen what has happened from March 2020. And a lot of the retail investors, there are a lot of new time people yeah. who've come to, new new age investors who've yeah. come to the market, right? Yeah. They've not seen cycles. They've not seen a meaningful correction. Does that bother you at all? No, it doesn't bother me because the color money is same. Mm -hmm. Whether you put it as a professional or some new guy puts it. Mm -hmm. The issue is that overall aggregate money mm -hmm. 
where it is going is it going into the uh, uh, building of the, the infrastructure is it going to build a uh, corpus i mean is it a primary issuance or is it a secondary like itc bat taking away say uh, 3 billion dollars or 2 and 1/2 billion dollars yeah. that doesn't help that much hmm. or indigo promoter taking away billion dollars that doesn't help hmm. Hmm. of course it is necessary part of the capital market but disproportionate amount should go into the primary issuance hmm. so like uh, 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 a telecom company issuing say 50000 crores worth of bonds or equity hmm. and that being subscribed hmm. what they will do they will go and put up uh, new towers new sure. you know sure. so sure. that will actually spur the economy you know it's it's really uh, interesting that you brought up some of these huge block deals that have happened and a lot of them have happened. i think 2023 we saw massive blocks coming in it's continuing in 24 yeah. and this is also a question that comes up uh, because at the end of the day because of the the retail revolution uh, a lot of the buyers are mutual funds so i mean i am buying at the end of the day when maybe a promoter is selling or maybe yeah, a very sophisticated team they also are right to sell They have a right to sell, absolutely. Mm-hmm. But is there any reason to worry because they are supposedly smart insiders? There is insiders nothing to worry. There is natural selling. market phenomenon. Okay. So we, you must understand. Mm-hmm. If you raise the prices, supply will come. Mm-hmm. Asman se supply hai. <laughs> Whether FIs sell, promoters <laughs> sell, block deal happens, new issuers come, supply will come. So first three years we saw the boom in the demand side mm-hmm. because of this inflow. Mm-hmm. Now you see the the uh, what do you call the the power of supply. but that does that mean that it may be for an end no, there's a bit it, of a top no, in the no, market no no yeah don't become too topish this that Achha. it's a part of the game hmm. see if, see if you if you're playing football hmm. i mean if one guy is manchester united other side is uh, modela oswald team <laughs> what will happen they'll just go and keep hitting why hmm. there has to be supply hmm. supply will come and that is the healthiest part okay. that's the real role of the stock market Okay so Mr Ramdev Agarwal not at all worried about the rise in promoter selling all the block trades he's saying it's a deeper market it's a healthy market the correction has made it even healthier and for a medium to long term investors is absolutely no reason to worry we'll play out more excerpts from that interview uh, Nigel he is expecting the nifty to double in the next 5 years so is a man who is saying invest for the future indeed uh, all right interesting uh, conversation we keep getting you uh, you know various parts of that conversation all through the day but uh, let's go to our special segment now charting trends mitesh chakar joins us to help us out with a few ideas uh, hi mitesh uh, welcome back on the show well let's talk about a couple of ideas that you have pidelight that's the stock that you're looking at as looking particularly good on the charts tell us more Nigel, I think you know uh, very importantly what Pitlet was doing since uh, uh, about June, uh, May, June of twenty-two was getting into a contracting pattern on the monthly basis, which means that the longer term charts were contracting. Actually, I saw that for the last about eighteen months, the stock didn't give any kind of absolute returns. The indicators were coming, uh, uh, were you know coming out from the overbought levels and uh, settling down on the monthly basis. So we saw the stock, you know, just being sideways broadly. not getting past 2800 and not falling much below 23 2400 on the downside that contraction has now come to an end and there's some kind of a breakout which has taken place recommend buying this one for targets of 3400 3600 i think you know is uh, looks very logical extension and even possibility of 3900 exists on the chart so these are the upside you know uh, this is the kind of upside which this stock price can give in the next 4 uh, to 6 to 7 months and unless something the stock starts breaking out below 2740 the long term trend and the bias will be on the upside so that's a very strong buy for me for the aforementioned price targets and the target price over the next few months is 3900 right yeah that's right okay over the next 5 to 7 months uh let's move on to the other one gujarat gas uh what's the chart telling you you know this is stock you know which had a very strong month uh, uh in the uh, on in, in january 2024 and then what we have seen is that uh, for the entire month of february and march the stock is giving a pullback now given the fact that this is a pullback happening on the longer term charts it gives you a very enticing entry point in terms of risk reward equation so accumulate the stock between 530 500 le- range and keep a stop below 455 so you have about 10% kind of a risk and the long term chart suggests targets of around 620 possibly 670 in the next 4 to 6 months so giving you a good re- risk reward equation from the current levels and Since the long-term trend is on the upside, very clearly a buy for me. All right, uh, 
Mitesh, I particularly want to know what you're going to say on HUL. You know, that stock goes into its shell for a while, for a few years sometimes, and then it comes up and then it moves. You know, as we saw, I think between 2000 to 2010, didn't move at all. 2000 to 2020, went like a rocket. And last few years, big underperformer. What's the view right now? In fact, I think, you know, in the near term, which is uh, a few months for the stock price on the long-term charts, uh, Nigel, if you observe the movement starting from uh, September of 21, I think on about eight or nine occasions, the stock has touched levels of 2670 on an intra-month basis, never giving a monthly closing above that. So it's, you know, some kind of a top formation which has happened over here. And now there is a breakdown below the monthly average. So my sense is that the stock is an underperformer. Avoid if somebody has it, it's an exit. I'm looking at sub 2000 levels as the minimum. We could see, you know, in, in, in panic, I think even levels of around uh, 1940 to about 1875. But I think this is not a stock which will participate in the upside. So if you have your money blocking over there, exit and I think, you know, try to look for better opportunities. And finally, SRF. Uh, even with a disclaimer here that I've just bought uh, SRF into my portfolio as well. I think, again, this is a stock, you know, which was consolidating uh, in the range of about 2200 to about 2600. That consolidation has already lasted 24 months and now there are early signs of a breakout. So, you know, I have bought some quantity. I would want to see the stock price get beyond this 26, 25, 26, 30 levels to add more. But I think once that happens, keep a stop at 2480 and the measuring implications of this breakout suggest that on the longer term charts, we could see the stock head towards 3250 as a minimum with 3450, 3500 as the logic.